Bravo. Request permission to engage enemy paratroopers and attempt to snatch a grid pop a uniform 259er, 119er. Break. Enemy is unaware of our presence at this time. Over. Solid copy. Hitman 23, Echo 5, Foxtrot. This is Hitman 2 Action. Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Commander's Voice. My guests today are Jack and Sue Talley, who are the authors of a book called Never Give Up the Jump, which is a, a story of Lieutenant George Gerwell. Did I say that correctly, Miss Sue? That is correct. Yeah. Who was a paratroop officer in the 508th Parachute Infantry Regiment during World War II and also Sue's dad. So, uh, Sue, Jack, welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to be here. Now, we're really excited to have you guys on board Uh as I told you about, we were talking a little bit before we started recording. This podcast was originally put together for members of the 2nd Airborne Association, and it's really exciting to uh, have you guys on board to talk about one of the original paratroopers in the division. So this this is just super exciting. So to, to jump right into it, uh, Miss Sue, since uh, George was your dad, could you kind of give us a rundown of the origin of this project? Well, when my dad passed away, we found about a thousand war letters. The majority of them, over 900 of them, were between my mom and my father. And the unique thing about this is that my dad was able to bring my mother's letters. He sent them home. Most of the letters that they have from this time frame are the men's because they arrived in the States and they could keep them. Most of the men burned the women's letters. They couldn't keep them. So my dad was able to, to keep them and send them home. So we found them along with other family letters and some other um, letters from other women that were officers' wives that knew my mom um, in, from the regiment. Yeah, they had to burn them for security purposes. So if they were captured, the Germans couldn't use them for propaganda. But George was, uh, we have these orders too. He sent home his orders and his 201 file. So we can track him pretty closely. He was ordered to process KIA and WIA effects at one time. So he was shipping boxes home and he saved the box for him. So he put his old mail back in there and his orders and everything like that and shipped that stuff back home. So we have mom and dad's conversation between 42 and 45. That That's absolutely amazing. What a, a beautiful window into what was going on at that time. And what a unique opportunity to understand your parents at a very primary source level that that's fantastic so you and didn't even about the best thing we have though the one of the unique things that also adds to this is we have a lot of information or letters from uh the home front meaning that when my mom joined the men were in north carolina when they did their at uh, camp mccall they were doing their advanced training the women joined them and they were there for about seven months. And while they were there, my mom got to know the other officers' wives, and they became very close. Time for the men to leave. Five of the women concocted an idea. Instead of writing individually to each other, they would write a round robin letter. One would write to two. Two would read the letter, write her letter. The two letters went to three, and it would go around. My mom is number three. Over the process of a year, 48 of the officers' wives joined in this round robin. So there's their letters. They added in um, baby pictures. We have obituaries. We have all kinds of stuff that were with these letters. It got around to two of the women wrote twice. It got around to my mom and my mom kept them. Oh so we have all of those letters too. So we have what they're going through, what's going on on the home front, some of my, my family's letters, as well as the letters between my parents and then obviously the history of what the regiment was going through. Wow, that that's absolutely amazing. And so did you not, you said it before, but I want to make sure I understand. You weren't aware of the existence of all this till after your parents passed? Uh, my dad. Uh, I had seen one or two letters here and there. Like most veterans, my dad did not talk about it. Uh, we had a few funny stories, but not very much. So when he passed away, my mom was still alive. We did find boxes of all kinds of things. There were different items and majority of them were letters. And so the family basically said, what do you want to do with all these World War II letters? And Jack basically said, we'll take them. And mom <laughs> said, sure, here you go. And, and this was about 2007, where we were cleaning out of the house. And dad had given us a bunch of items prior to that. We were in contact with him. and. Uh, 
he shipped home a parachute canopy from Operation Market Garden. He used there, and he sh shipped home all his battle maps and things yes, like bedroll, that. Bedroll from the Battle of the Bulge. Yeah, we had already donated these things to the 508th section of the Camp Blanding Museum and uh, Camp, Camp Blanding, Florida. And so we thought we'd had the mother load of things. His parachute's on display today there as part of the 508 uh, thing, uh, presentation there. But uh, we got uh, back to uh, 2007, Susan, he said, oh, no, there's boxes of letters back here. So we put them in UPS boxes and um, mailed them home. And we, we were in Richland, Washington, and flew back to Atlanta and met them. We got them about 07. It was uh, only until about 2018 that we started on them. Uh, Sue's mom lived to 2016. It was kind of hard to get that project going. It was a little too personal for Sue, and, which is completely understandable. Yes, sir. But after we went to Europe and we did a uh, tour of uh, all the battlefields the 508 fought in that motivated us and, and our retirement to be able to, to take this project on. One thing I want to add about those round robin letters, though, is that uh, 11 of those women wound up being Gold Star wives. And they wrote, eight of those women wrote their letters after they'd gotten the news that their husband had been killed in action. And those letters are just incredibly emotional. I can imagine. Now, one thing I find very interesting, Jack, if you could share with the audience what you do professionally and how that actually played into your understanding of this material. Yeah, I'm a I'm a licensed psychologist in Georgia, and for years I work with uh, kids with disability, traumatized kids. I was a specialist in PTSD, and when uh, our daughter and son-in-law went to Iraq, it's actually Sue's daughter, my stepdaughter, but I'm the one that's been around with all the military things, so we're, I'm practically papa for those grandkids, so uh, I called on my daughter to make it easier. Um, when they came back from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, I was winding up my school and uh, career, career with children. So I did some retraining and I've been dealing with veterans with PTSD since about 2014. Uh, I worked with VA contractors, got on their list. I did their help veterans get their PTSD benefits and work with the VA doing that. And I still do that. I'm going to wind that up in the next few months. I want to spend time, more time training and uh, Multi I'm multiplying myself. I'm I'm per I'm booked up through May now, just working part time. There's a big need for that. But uh, because of our connection, though, with uh, being military parents, and our my dad too for the blue, flew the Berlin airlift. He was on the tail end of World War II. With our connection to World War II, I I've been able to connect with veterans that the a lot of the rookies that the VA hires is not able to. Yes, sir. So did the, did your training experience help you as you were reading through the letters and as the, the time progressed through the war, you can kind of understand at a deeper level shifts in well, attitude and emotions? It, absolutely. George's letters, George was shot through the left leg on D-Day at, at a famous place for the 82nd. He was with yes. the original group, we believe, that captured the Manoir at Lafayette Bridge. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, so we were when we were going through the, the, the letters, we generally put them in a chronological order by postmark. And when we passed D-Day and passed the battle sections, we were a little bit like, well, I'm glad we interviewed George at one time and he talked to us a, a little, little bit, bit over three days the first time I met him. But um, we wish we'd had more about Normandy and he couldn't write a lot because of the censorship regulations. But he got to Frankfurt, Germany during the occupation. Censorship was lifted. And uh, he goes, well, honey, I guess you'd like to know what I did on the 6th of June and wrote his wife two long letters about his D-Day experience. We have it in writing what he did. Oh, my goodness. That's absolutely amazing. Because I mean, you say Lafayette Causeway, Lafayette Bridge. Now we're, we're, we're talking the stuff of what Clay Blair yeah. called instant legend. Uh, Second Airborne Holy Ground. Yeah, yes. yes, sir. Exactly. That, that, that's, we've that's walked, we've walked that area in 2018 yeah. before we started digging into the book and did not know we were walking the same ground where, yeah. where George was injured. That but, yeah, he was shot through the leg there um, and soldiered on until the ninth. And one of in the letter in these two letters, he we I have to laugh. It's my dad. Totally. He goes back. He tries to avoid the medics. And eventually, he basically says in his letter, old Doc Klein finally caught up with me. And that's when they 
ship me back. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you, me, uh, you know, they didn't take morphine shots or things like that. If they were still going to go, it would knock them out and make them helpless. So he didn't take any pain meds till the ninth after being shot through the left leg. Yeah, that's that well, paratrooper attitude. Bridge all the way to Shea Dupont. That's yeah, outstanding. Yeah, tell us about. But my point of telling all that was when he did get back to England, England he had lost so many friends. He had seen and done so much. His letters are full of PTSD symptoms, and he couldn't say what was wrong with himself. Even though he was in safety in the hospital, his uh, letter writing went from like three a week to, to, to three a month. He, he said, honey, ghosts and memories and a horrible loneliness make me sick inside. And, they, uh, and so after that, he always had difficulty during downtime, like a lot of soldiers today. They're fine when they're on the front line. They're fine when they got to get admission, but don't give them time to think. Yes, sir. And he, from what it sounds like, he made the he made the jump into Market Garden, and he also fought in the Ardennes as well. So he, yeah, he stayed busy. He up, so he healed up enough from June to September, yeah, to be reactivated again. Uh, he took, got his combat job uh, role again and jumped into uh, Operation Market Garden. Uh, made it back to uh, through that whole ordeal. Made it, when they mo they moved their base camp then to Reims, France, and he was riding home at the first of December. How this was just horrible. He'd rather be in the front lines in this current setup, and he didn't know it. He wrote one letter on the fourteenth of December saying that, and three days later they were shipped to the Battle of the Bulge. He didn't know what he was asking for. <laughs> be careful what you wish for. Exactly. Yes, so, exactly. Yeah. Now he was the, as I understand, he was the regimental headquarters company XO. Was that his role throughout the, his entire time in combat from Normandy through the end of the war, or did he change positions? He didn't change positions. Now he got really, really angry that he did once his captain, Captain Robert Abraham, was injured uh, right at the end of the Battle of the Bulge on the way into uh, Germany at uh, Landsworth, Belgium. He he didn't get promoted. A guy that had joined the 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 unit outranked him by a few weeks that we found out through the records. He thought he outranked him, but it was the other way around. So the other guy was promoting me. I'm going to let those West Pointers have it. No one knows anything but them. And all those kind of things are in the letters. But it wasn't his only job. George, I couldn't believe how many jobs he had. Yeah, they kept assigning him all kinds of stuff. He never told my mom, but he was in charge of the, the bazooka the bazooka team, and that's why at at the manor house at Lafayette Bridge, they call he called up a, a I think a bazooka team. bazooka team. That's all they could find from the airdrops. And two teams out of twelve had equipment that he was in charge of for the so, for the regimental headquarters. Company. So he was the regimental gas, the chemical officer. Uh, yeah, he he was that pretty much. Maybe for the division, he gave schools for both the division and the regiment for uh, gas warf uh, chemical warfare, not just poison gas, but anything had to do with chemicals, munitions that were colored, detecting gas coming in. Uh, he was a, 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 a chemical officer a and by training before he engineer. transferred to the airborne. So how, did he enlist after Pearl Harbor or did he have a reserve commission? How did he wind up even he was, associated? He, um, he did reserves, he was, um, a reservist, he went to um, Oregon State. ROTC. ROTC. And then was commissioned into the chemical uh, warfare. warfare. And went the, to Edgewood Arsenal. Yeah, yeah, went to Edgewood Arsenal. But there, doing the training, he figured that he was going to miss the war. All they did was train troops, and it wasn't what he thought it was. And they would play cards and drink a fifth of Bushmill almost every night. Oh so he figured he end up either an alcoholic and dead or he was going to end up missing the war so he needed to do something else so he was one of the last one of the few to transfer over and request to be a paratrooper oh, <laughs> even amazing. though he was afraid of heights <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's absolutely amazing so did he link up with the uh the regiment at camp mccall uh, no, at at Camp Landing. Landing. he was the they, original. Ones, yeah, they yeah. they they started it in October, and he was transferred over in November. Uh, of and 42. that would have been October of forty-two. Yeah, they started in October forty-two, and his transfer came through in November, early November of forty-two, was when he was back down to Landing. And uh, we know all this because the letter trail between mom and dad cover all that, yeah. all the way back before they were married, their engagement. 
their their wedding in uh, April of forty three, mm -hmm. and uh, their his engagement, uh, his proposal, her acceptance, all that in letters. That's absolutely beautiful. So when he so he's at Camp Landing, and then did the entire regiment attend parachute training at Benning together? Did they ship to Benning? And yes, yes, they, they did. Uh, let me tell you something about Blanding. He, George saved the most amazing stuff. And we're digging through this, these uh, papers of his, not just letters, but we were on across a boxing program. You know, did doc, doc, okay. uh, doc nine, document nine. And um, it's a boxing program. And so each, it's an entertainment. And so for each weight class, they have um, a program. And at the bottom of it, it says, regimental sing and they had a couple of songs listed and you turn this legal size sheet over and it's called johnny paratrooper and it's blood on the risers oh my goodness <laughs> yeah, this, yeah, yeah. yeah 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 uh, yeah and um uh, and he, here's the uh boxing program and with a few songs like I've been working on the railroad and <laughs> marching along. And then you turn that sheet over and on the reverse side is the earliest copy of Blood on the Risers we know of. It's dated January 11th, 43. Wow. That is a and, fine. And That's they call it Johnny Paratroopers. And the words in the chorus have changed. A little uh, bit. Well, like that song always has evolved through the years. People take away, add to it, and that kind of stuff. But because we got interested and everybody interested in this stuff, uh, a reenactor group who actually reenacts George Company in the 508, uh, a, a uh, family had contacted them about their dad, who was a medic at Camp Blanding. And in his, in his remains, he claims to have written this song. His name is J.D. Kelly. Oh, my and there's goodness that those families uh those families archives that that's the author of this song that is so cool that to talk about that's some cool. original airborne history yeah 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 uh that's uh he saved some other things on the boat over on the james parker there was a daily newsletter that came out and he saved every one of those Wow. And on the boat back on the Matawaska victory, uh, the 8508 was all scattered by then because they went home by how many points they had. It took officers a long time to get home, but he saved every one of those newsletters on the ride home. And we have those. We include them in the book. But historians say that's a unique set. Um, that is so cool. So so the book itself, yeah, I haven't had the opportunity to get it in my hands yet. I'm looking forward to ordering my copy. Is it a the is it a collection of the letters or did you use the letters to write a narrative? We it's it's mostly letters, but we do have narrative in between. So you're going to have some narrative, you're going to have letters or part of the letters and the narrative. So it's it's a combination. I think that those two things woven together would be the best answer. Okay, beautiful. And how long did it take you guys to write this? Well, the whole project was about almost four years from start to finish. Um, yeah. Writing-wise, I want to say at least two, maybe three. Three, <laughs> yeah. And then, then this last year is with COVID delays and that logistics problems, it took about another year to actually to actually get the book out. Oh, uh, that's but it looks beautiful. But, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, it's. Uh, we, we thank Gail Worst. I don't know if you know the name Spencer Worst. No, sir. He's a five, five guy from World War II. Gail is his niece. And together they wrote uh, Descending, Descending from, from the, the Clouds. clouds. It's, it's one of the stories of the 505th. And Gail has, uh, she has a PhD in English and French. She was involved with some translation work during some of the Normandy ceremonies in the 90s. And I can't tell you how many books she's either authored or edited about the 82nd Airborne. Uh, Nordyke, uh, Lafaro, those are the guys she's edited. So we were fortunate to, she took us on. And uh, so we, we think it's, we're proud of it. It's well written in it. And she did a great job helping us weave this story in and out that's fantastic and i mean you t talk about being up there with some of the greats in, in terms of people who have recorded airborne history so you you guys were in good hands with, with your editing team that's for sure well we've rubbed, we've rubbed shoulders with the right people we hope it rubbed <laughs> off <laughs> yeah 
So is this is the book itself is uh, I see you've got your your copy in hand. Is this available for order now? It is. And and where can people just get on Amazon or? You can get on Amazon. You can go to Simon and Schuster, and they are our distributor, and they'll have all the places that you can get it from. But it's like bar, uh, Books a Million, Barnes and Noble, uh, and the books. Yeah, yeah, and it'll be released in Simon and Schuster UK next month. Okay, fantastic. So, is it on the shelves now? Like, if you went down to the local Barnes and Nobles, a chance it would be there, or? I think you have to go through a process to get them actually in the store. They're not <laughs> in the local store. Uh, but uh, please realize uh, Tuesday will be, it's been out three weeks. I mean, gotcha. this is really yeah. pr pretty newly released. Yeah. We're That's only funny. a little bit excited. Huh? Yeah. Oh, you should be. This is this is a huge achievement. And what a great tribute to your mom and your dad and to the troopers of the 508. And what a great contribution to airborne history. Well, thank you. Yeah, I think the biggest thing was it's my parents. Yes, but it's also the story of, of the 508 and the and the men that were also involved, the men and women of the regiment at that time, because we do talk about several of them. Oh, God, it's well, and very interesting. Never give up the jump did come from uh, we have a letter. Uh, the letter was written by Jane Creary. Captain uh, Hal Creary was a friend of my dad. My dad was extremely close. His best buddy was um, Donald Hardwick. They called him Ripper. And the three of them knew each other. Uh, and so Jane got to know my mom. During Normandy, they couldn't find Hal. He was missing in action. In August, my mom writes a letter. And we have the letter asking if she had heard from my dad, if there was any way she could find out, if pass on any information, if they know anything about Hal because he's missing. They're hoping he's a POW with the French resistance. Yeah, this is Jane writing mom saying In that. August, yeah. my mom, we have the letter from my mom writing my dad, asking about it, saying, I know it's, it's hush hush. If you can tell me anything, um, and we have dad's letter back saying, it's hard to believe these things are true. It's been really tough over here. If you read between the lines, he's basically trying to say he's not with us anymore. Yes, Jane doesn't find out until September that her husband was killed um, in, in June. And so in December, she writes her round robin letters. Um, and in her letter, she says, girls, we have to keep our chins up. Remember, we're paratroopers too. We cannot give up the jump. Oh, and wow. so we changed it to never give up the jump. And that's the thing with these gold star women of their resilience, their support, their, mm -hmm. it, it's amazing. You know, they, yeah. you know, their attitude and, and their support. And then she does proceed to um, share Hal's last letter that he had left before he jumped that she got after he, he didn't make it back. Yeah, Hal uh, was the company commander for company H. Uh, Captain Creary was misdropped at D-Day. Uh, they were scattered all over. He was captured in a, uh, a, 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 a bunch of other officers. They were in a line of German vehicles with POWs in them. They were strafed by P-47. The, the uh, Germans jumped in the ditches but wouldn't allow the prisoners to take oh, cover and go by friendly fire with a bunch of other 508 officers and other men at the time. This unit is so famous, we're able to tell a story about all 48 of those guys. But what happened with Captain Creary at base camp in Nottingham, England, that he left a letter and said, guys, if I don't make it back, mail this letter home. And what Jane did at the end of her round robin letter, she retyped Hal's last letter. Oh, my goodness. That, that's an amazing thing to have. That's that's just... That, uh, the way you read it... First time we read it, we just we'd write and ball and write and cry and write. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's a very emotional kind. Of but it's a it's a beautiful letter. Yeah, again. and that kind of story is repeated with several other of the uh, uh, the people who were wounded and killed. And uh, and what we found out was what a disaster Normandy was for the airborne. The five hundred eight lost more men in the Normandy campaign and more casualties than the rest of the war combined. That's absolutely amazing. But it, it, when you think about the uh, the impact that the regiment and the division had in order to be able to facilitate the landings, but at the same time, the, at what cost? It's just, a, it, yeah. it, it boggles the mind. 
Yeah, yeah, especially how scattered the 507th and the 508th were. They were scattered all over the place. Yes, sir, certainly. So do you guys have any plans on going back now that you have all this information in your head and maybe walking the ground again? Uh, yeah, go yeah. ahead, Jack. No, you have uh, to... Oh, absolutely. We're going to go we're sooner than later. We're going to go the end of May. Oh, wow. And it's like we're not getting any younger. Of what better time than now when this book's just gotten out? And you have a list of endorsements we were able to acquire. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, before, uh, and those are included in the book. Because we went to 508 reunions, we were able to get to know people like Tulai Band Man from, um, from Holland and other historians and uh, our connection with folks. So we'll wind up going and we're speaking at an event at Wallington Park on the 29th of May. Oh, That's the... Yeah, yeah, they they have us on the program, and then uh, then we make our way over to Normandy, and we're part of a uh, a ceremony at uh, the um, cemetery there in Colville. I can barely say it. Uh, yeah, uh, so that we we've been connected with a group that flowers the graves of the Americans over there, and they're doing a ceremony. And they they said they were going to include us in their program. So, Dad has a couple, and some of the women of these round robin women. Their husbands are buried there, and so we can. Uh, what an honor! That's uh, that's just incredible. The other the other thing. Um, and then we go to Belgium, and then we go to Holland, and so and the yeah. same connections there. And the other thing that's really neat when we go to Nottingham, um, because of contacts there, uh, we've been asked to on their on Memorial Day there, we're going to lay a wreath for the eighty second. Beautiful. That's that's amazing, and that's wonderful. And that's we're. That's we've done this <laughs> you guys you like I said you guys have made a tremendous contribution to the history of the regiment and the division and uh and to fans of the airborne i can't wait to read the book it's interesting you mentioned tula she's an absolute gem by the way uh mm -hmm. an amazing researcher and a, a blessing to so many different airborne historians uh i think that's great that you hooked up with her uh that that's just fantastic so my, my last question <laughs> with, with her, with her at, in holland she's going to put us up and she's oh, going to show us personally take us around so that'll be really nice I, I know you'll be super busy but if you if if you remember tell her ben power says hi i'd appreciate it uh, <laughs> well, we will. And, and eddie lamberti and in belgium who's an expert in the battle of bulges we're going to have the same kind of treatment there so we're uh, we're excited that, that, yeah that's absolutely else, fantastic another reason for me to go ahead and retire along with being able to pull social security in the next few months it's like no <laughs> stuff it's a once in a lifetime thing to get to do this yes sir so my last question for you guys and then um uh, is what did you learn throughout this process that you maybe thought you knew before but then you it kind of opened your eyes or... i think the biggest thing that was it was a surprise i really didn't know but the biggest surprise for me because it never showed in my dad was how much ptsd there was <laughs> that he had gone through and was going through at that whole time while he was serving. Um, and that was, that was an eye opener for me. I was one of the lucky ones. Many of the men came back and, and went through a bad situations. Their lives were very difficult when they got back. My dad was, he's a very, a very a very thoughtful person, a very caring person. Um, and so he he weathered through it he made it through and i never knew um i think the other big thing that was really touching for me was that early on in 42 before my parents were married he would wrote a letter to my mom and basically it was almost christmas time and he's, he's hearing carols and he's kind of in deep thought and he's thinking about the men and being an officer and being in charge of them he said I don't know what we can do or how these guys, after what they're going to experience and what they're going to go through, how can we ever... How can they ever forget? Yeah, can they ever forget and how can we ever make them whole again? Wow. He was already worrying about that even before... Deployment. Deployment. Yeah. That, that's just, that just shows you the kind of man your father was. Yeah, he really was. And not only that, he had great resilience and he did what veterans who are successful with resilience do. He got busy with uh, being a chaplain, working in his church. He practically raised Sue in the local theater. They got involved in uh, local musicals, musicals yeah. and uh, 
Sue wound up being a ballet dancer from that kind of thing in, in, in a day. And so he, and he quit. The book is full of alcoholism that the men drank their way through Europe. Their but, medicine. Yeah, their medicine. And, but they, he hardly drank as far as yeah, got out that of I that. remember. Yeah. So he had social support. He had uh, self care, diet, sleep, exercise, having a new mission in life to take care of things. Even though he worked at Hanford, Camp Hanford out in Washington State, making the nukes for the Cold War. That was his uh, uh, job after service. And he uh, also did something spiritual with his life, not necessarily going to church, but he did something that has some meaning in life for other people. And he stayed sober. Can you tell my four S's I'm always telling veterans? I'm but, trying, it, it, it sounds like in addition to some great history, you, you kind of have a handbook for veterans on how to deal with their own experiences here. It might have to be my next book. We'll see. Yeah, but. and it does. It, it, Jack has said that in, he shared some of this with uh, some of the vets he's been talking to, and it seems to help. It really resonates with them. I, 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 t I read some of George's statements and, and tell them about you know, downtime. I think that was one of my biggest takeaways is how bad veterans have it during downtime. Uh, they, they really have it bad. But the biggest thing in writing of that I learned about World War II is how brutal the combat was in Germany. You always hear about the personal hand-to-hand -hand nastiness of the Japanese theater, but you don't realize uh, we have a collection of letters we had access to by the adjutant for the regiment, uh, Cap Captain Bill Nations, William Nations, who was later killed late in, uh, late in the war. And it says about Normandy, he said, the Germans were so brutal to us that it took us several days before we could get the men to take prisoners. Oh, my goodness. Well, that says it all. It, yes, yes. It, it really, D, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It, 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 we don't want to take anything away from World War II vets, but they don't need to put on a, they don't need to be glamorized or put on a pedestal of what they did back then. It was brutal, nasty war. Oh, yes, sir. I think the best thing we can do is uh, understand them and respect them for the men and women that they were rather than uh, turn them into two-dimensional figures. Exactly. Yes, yes. And so that that's what really um, glamorized is the word. They shouldn't be glamour. That's the word I was looking for. I'm tracking. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. So everybody, my name is Ben Powers. This has been the Commander's Voice. My guests today have been Sue and Jack Talley, authors of Never Give Up the Jump, which sounds like an amazing book and I can't wait to read. Guys, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you for having us. See you now. Bye.